things are important to you, but the question is, how important is college and the grades you'll get at college compared to Judgment Day and how God will judge you? That's the question of the day. Because Judgment Day will come, God will judge you, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, even the secret things that no one else knows about. God is going to judge you for those things. No matter how good you do at school this semester, you get straight A's, good GPA, too good at sports, intramurals, make lots of friends. But if you die in your sins, it'll all be for naught. If you reject Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how much supposed good you do with your life, you're still going to give an account for your sins. And the Bible says, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor covetous, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor extortioners, nor revilers shall inherit the kingdom of God. So the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Now if you're on that list I just mentioned, the Bible makes it clear you're right now you are not righteous and in your current state you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't deceive yourself by thinking it's okay to keep on sinning and call yourself a Christian. Don't deceive yourself by heaping up for yourself pastors who will proclaim to you false things to make you feel better about yourself when you're in your sin. Sin always leads to hell and always will lead to hell. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross so you can keep on sinning. Jesus Christ died on the cross so you'd stop it. So you'd stop things. So you stop living for yourself and start living for him who died for you and rose again. Yeah, Christ didn't die on the cross so you can be a sodomite. Christ didn't die on the cross so you can be a sexually immoral person. Christ didn't die on the cross so you can go out and get drunk on the weekends and smoke weed. Christ died to deliver you from all your sins didn't die so you can be a mocker or a scoffer. The Bible talks about people like you, young man. Mockers and scoffers coming in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Exhibit A, what the Bible is talking about. Mockers and scoffers who come in. You have to give an account for every idle word the Bible says. So you mock and scoff as you walk by, you have to give an account for that. The Bible says, you believe there's one God, you do well, but even demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? I don't know what your origin is, where you've come from as far as state is concerned, city is concerned, but in the Bible Belt we have this problem of people saying they're Christians when they're really not. They live like the devil all week and go to a building on Sunday and Wednesday and think that makes them a Christian. Well, if that's you, you're deceiving yourself. You're a hypocrite. And the Bible makes it clear hypocrites won't inherit his kingdom either. In fact, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. Yes, God will make it all known. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom he must give an account. Yes, the God of the Bible sees your actions, knows every word that's come out of your mouth, even knows the intents and motivations of your heart. Well, you're giving account for your filthy language, sinner. Yes, you, you sinners have been raised by sinners, now you're, just as, you're worse than your parents are. It's the wicked generation, wicked and adulterous generation. No respect for elders, no respect for themselves, what this generation is. It's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed 
from its filthiness. A generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. That's this generation. You talk to anyone any way you wish to, no respect for adults, for elders, you're going to give an account for that. The Bible says, honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Well, if you're in sin, you're not honoring your father, your mother, yourself, or anybody else. You're definitely not honoring God if you're in sin. And the Bible says about filthy language, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that you may impart grace to the hearers. Back in the day, if someone had a filthy mouth around elders or around preachers, they would say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been saying that. Nowadays, people that have flow out of their mouth like water over a waterfall. No big deal to have filthy language come out of your mouth. Well, it is a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. But this generation has become so wicked and so perverse, they think that a man could be a woman and a woman could be a man. They don't even know which bathroom to go into. They don't even know who, who, what gender they can have sexual activity with. That's how bad this generation is. And anyone who doesn't obey those, that ideology is considered intolerant and judgmental and hateful. What a bunch of nonsense. You know, the real hateful people are those who let friends live in sin without any warning at all. Let a man be a woman, let a woman be a man. No big deal, right? Not with the God it is. It's a big deal to God. In fact, people who engage in such activity, the Bible says God gave them over to it, to a debased mind, to do things that they ought not do. And if that's you, you need to wake up before it's too late. Open your eyes and wake up before it's too late. Fall for all the lies and deceptions of the devil. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Christ came that you might have life and life more abundantly. And when he says life abundantly, it's not talking about prospering financially or even physically. It's talking about knowing God being known by God, being in intimate relationship with God. That's what Jesus is referring to, talking about abundant life. But the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The devil wants you to dress like you're a prostitute, wants you to have sex with anyone you want, wants you to be confused what gender you are, wants you to have filthy language pour out of your mouth, get drunk all the time, get high all the time, wants you to learn the wicked philosophy of man like evolution. That's what the devil wants for you. But God wants you to know the truth. Because the truth will set you free. And Jesus Christ is the truth. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Bible says about Jesus Christ, all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ, the one whose name you blaspheme throughout your day when you get upset, get frustrated. That's the only name you can be saved with, the name of Jesus. The only name that can save you from your sins, the only person who can save you from your sins and cleanse you and make you right with God, Jesus Christ. The one that you, you, uh, you use to blaspheme and drag through the mud, Jesus Christ. The one you reject each and every day you go on in your sin, Jesus Christ. The one who you say you worship, but the name you give to Jesus, the character you give to him, is not the character he has in the Bible. Many people say they know Jesus, say they worship Jesus, but their life says something different. What are you talking, about, right? talking about Jesus Christ. What are you talking about? Well, the Bible gives you a test of how you can know that you know him or not. So you're not deceiving yourself. In 1 John 2, 3 through 4, the Bible says, Now by this we know that we know Jesus, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So you say you know Jesus, but you have filthy words come out of your mouth, you don't know him. You say you know Jesus, but you're a sodomite, you don't know him. 
You say, you know, Jesus, but you're having sex outside of marriage. You don't know him according to the Bible. You say, you know, Jesus, but you're getting drunk on the weekends. The Bible says you don't know him. You're deceiving yourselves. Don't deceive yourselves any longer. Wake up. Come to a knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ wants to set you free from your sin because your sin makes you committing sin makes you a slave to sin. Do you not know to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You're that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. And then it talks about Christians. But God be thanked that though you were a slave to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered and having been set free from sin, they became slaves of righteousness. That's what happens in a Christian's life when they become born again. They obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which they were delivered and having been set free from sin became a slave to righteousness. The Bible says about Jesus Christ who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. For we were like sheep going astray have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Yes, Jesus Christ is a good shepherd. The devil is a wolf. And oftentimes he comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes, your hateful looks reveal your heart, young lady. Your hateful looks towards my son reveal the state of your heart. You don't love the truth. I thought college campuses were supposed to be lovers of the truth. What it is, is lovers of ideology, certain ideologies anyway, lovers of falsities. That's what Christian campuses have become. Not lovers of the truth. If you love the truth, you'd obey the truth. You'd believe the truth. You'd follow the truth. But I've been preaching on college campuses for quite some time now about 13 years and what I found is college campuses are havens for sin just a den of sin all manner of wickedness goes on at college campuses typically sex outside of marriage like crazy STIs, STDs all kinds of drug activity going on drunkenness Filthy language, idolatry, rebelliousness. That's what I found about college campus. Maybe you're the exception to the rule. Maybe you don't involve yourself in those things. But most of you do. I mean, you say you come here to learn, but I wonder how many of you spent more time in front of the TV, on social media, or in front of a video game system than you did in your books this past week. I know it's the first week, but still. Your actions reveal your heart. Jesus said, you said, know them by their fruit. What kind of fruit's hanging off the tree of your life? Are you involving yourself in sin each and every day? Are you dressing with skin-tight clothing on? Had filthy language come out of your mouth? Are you getting drunk? Are you having sex outside of marriage? Yeah, that reveals the conviction of your heart, sinner. Yes, people don't love the truth. I put the truth on a sign, people walk by and give me the middle finger. Well, you're just revealing your heart. That's all you're doing. You're showing people around you that you hate the truth and you love your sin. That's the facts. If you love the truth and hated sin as Jesus does, then you'd be like Jesus. And Jesus was holy. He was holy. He wasn't sinful. But the Bible says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lust. See, your lust should be former if you're a Christian. You should be obedient children if you're a Christian. But listen, if you're not a Christian, I understand. You love your sin. You have a carnal heart, carnal mind. You don't set your thing on things above, but things below. You're not converted. You're not born again. You're not regenerated. So you love your sin. You love your selfishness. You love your pride. Whatever other sin you're engaging in, you love it. But I'm here to tell you that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. 
that God opposes the proud. That's what I'm here to tell you. All right, laugh it up now, sinners. Laugh it up now, because you won't be laughing about this on Judgment Day. It's a serious stuff. I won't see a smile on my face today. This is about your soul, about your eternity, about where you're going to spend eternity. And you laugh about it. The joke's on you, sinner. You're in trouble with God. You better sober yourself up and get right. You better sober yourself and get right with God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. Sinners these days get happy about all kinds of things. Laugh at all kinds of things. Laugh at filthy jokes. Laugh at filthy movies. Laugh at all kinds of things that grieve the heart of God. But I'm here to tell you, you need to let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. You need to humble yourself in the sight of God. Not be puffed up in your pride. As I said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And when that fall comes for you, there'll be no getting up. Not that time. When Christ returns or when you die, it's too late to get right with God. Be too late then. That's why you have today. As the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Your life, what is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The King, King David said, Lord, teach me to number my days. What you ought to do. You young people ought to number your days and realize you're not as invincible as you think you are. You may not live to be 75 years old. You may not live to be 25 years old. But you play around with your souls, if you will. You play around with your souls if God doesn't even exist, let alone that he'll judge you someday. What a foolish way to live your life. If you live your life as if God doesn't exist, you live in a fantasy world. You don't live in reality. It's a fantasy world to live as if God doesn't exist. It's a fantasy world to live as if Jesus Christ won't judge you for all your thoughts, words, and deeds. Many of you are away from your parents for the first time in your life, and you think you have some kind of freedom, supposedly. And you do whatever you want to do. And now we see what comes out of your heart, what you truly are like. Some of you maybe went to church back home, but you came here. Don't go to church. Don't care about reading your Bible. Don't care about prayer. Don't care about living holy. Because you're out from under the bondage of your parents. No, sin is bondage. Sin is bondage. As Jesus Christ said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. 1 John 3 says, whoever sins of the devil. So keep telling yourself that, that you're free because you have no, no parents around that tell you what to do and watch over you, you can do whatever you want. That's not true freedom. True freedom is in Christ. True freedom is submitting your will to his will. That's what true freedom is. Submitting yourself to Jesus Christ because let's face it, you and I both have proven to God that we're not fit to run our own lives. We've proven to God that we mess it up. We do the wrong things. We say the wrong things. We think the wrong things. But when we submit our life to Christ, to his rulership, his dominion over our life, then our life becomes what it ought to be, what it should be. You know, Jesus Christ died on the cross, not so you can just have an Easter egg hunt and think about him once a year and forget about him the rest of the year. Jesus Christ died on the cross to free you from your sin and to influence you to give yourself to him. 
I mean, Jesus Christ gave it all for you, and all he's asking for back is it all, your whole life. Jesus Christ said that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you doing that today? Are you loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Well, if you're sinning, you're not doing either. If you're sinning, you're not loving God because Jesus Christ said, if you love God, you'll keep his commandments. And if you're sinning in front of your neighbor, you're not loving them either. You're influencing them in a wrong way. And so you're not keeping the first or second greatest commandment through which all the law is fulfilled. This world loves to talk about love, but they don't know what love is. This world thinks love is letting everyone do whatever they want to do at all times and never judge them for it. That's supposedly love in this world. Nonsense. That's not love. Love is wanting the greatest good for somebody. And the greatest good for everybody that they repent of all their sins, forsake their sins, trust in Christ, and follow him. That's the greatest good for you. That's what I desire for you. As the Bible says, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. So God wants for you. He wants you to turn and live. He wants you to give up your sin, give up your sex outside of marriage, give up your porn watching, give up your drunkenness, give up your pot smoking. That's love. That's loving God. Talking about Jesus Christ, what are you talking about? Yeah. Pot smokers are going to hell if they don't repent. I know they are. Yeah. The Bible says so. Yeah, you are. You don't have to go there, though. Of course I am. It's a public campus. It's America. You have a filthy mouth, too. That's going to send you to hell as well. What did you say? Your filthy mouth is going to send you to hell as well. But you can repent, young man. You can open your eyes, come to a knowledge of the truth, humble yourself, give up your sins, and follow Christ. You are. You are going to hell for smoking weed. But you don't have to go to hell. You can stop your weed smoking. You're going to be the doobie in hell smoking. Okay. You're going to be smoking hell. The smoke of your torment rise up forever and ever, the Bible says. Man. You think it's a, a, a funny game? It's not a game, young man. It's about your soul. Yeah, well, have a good eternity. Get right with God. Give up your sins. Yeah, you, you people think it's a, just a funny thing to smoke weed. While well, you destroy your brain, make, make yourself lazy. Want to sit around and do nothing all day? I've been around pot smokers before, back in high school. All they want to do is sit around and eat snacks all day. They don't want to do anything. They're lazy. And just because the government in some states has approved the smoking of pot does not mean God approves of it. It wouldn't matter if the whole world approved of it. God still doesn't. God doesn't approve of your shaking your head and preaching the truth either. Yeah, you won't be doing that to Jesus on, on, on Judgment Day, sir. You'll give an account then. But it doesn't matter what the federal government or state government does, what they legalize, it doesn't make a difference. In God's eyes, all sin is still forbidden. All sin is still illegal. All st sin is still against God. And all sin will still lead to hell. That's what God says. God doesn't change. God doesn't change because America changes or the world changes. The world can approve of whatever they want to approve of. Doesn't mean God approves of it. The Bible doesn't change and God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is going to judge you according to his perfect law. Perfect and holy law. Not the law of this land. 
not the law of this country or the law of certain states or certain countries in the world. But God has a perfect law. It's found in his word. You want to know what it says? Well, open it up and read it. In fact, today, God's word has become so accessible, you don't even have a book with pages. You all have smartphones. Break them out. Go to BibleGateway.com and start reading. This generation is so lazy, they won't even do that. And you'll be given an account for not reading, your neglect of reading God's Word. And you stand before God and you say, God, I didn't know that. He'll say, well, you had access to the Bible. Why didn't you read it? Everything you need to know about God is found in the Scriptures. Everything you need to walk a godly life is found in the Scriptures. Everything you need to be saved from your sins is found in the Scriptures. The Bible, the Holy Bible, Genesis through Revelation. I'm not talking about the Bhagavad Gita from the Hindus. I'm talking about the Quran from the Muslims or the Book of Mormon from the Mormons. I'm talking about the New World Translation from Jehovah's Witness. I'm talking about the Bible. And I'll tell you this, you should spend a lot more time reading the Bible than reading your school books than watching TV and sitting in front of YouTube. She spent a lot more time reading the Bible, studying the Bible, obeying the Bible, than getting on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. I mean, think of how absurd it is. All these different ways of quote-unquote social media. But how many people do you actually know in social media? It's all just fake. People are going to make you think there's someone else on social media. I appreciate you. But who do you know in person? See, most people, their relationship with quote-unquote Jesus is just like their relationship with people on social media. They don't really know him. They don't know about him, but they don't know him. I just want to shake your hand. God bless you. Okay, thank, thank you for doing this. Amen. But so many people, they treat their relationship with quote-unquote Jesus like they treat their friends quote-unquote on Facebook. They don't really know them. They see what they post in their news feed or on their page. But don't really know those people. I mean, think about it. 5,000 friends? How many of them do you really know? Five or six? But Jesus Christ doesn't want a social media relationship. He wants a true relationship where you submit yourself to him, surrender to him, live your life for Jesus Christ. You read his word, you believe his word, you obey his word. Where he knows you and you know him. That's the kind of relationship Jesus Christ wants. He doesn't want this once a week, Sunday, Wednesday, you go to a building and think you know Jesus kind of nonsense. He wants you to actually know him and be known by him. And the Bible says, I said earlier, now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You think it's fun and games, young man, but it's not. Your sin's going to cost you your soul. Don't be laughing then. You won't be laughing in hell, sinner. Yeah, you will see me there. And God will remind you all the words I spoke to you if you don't repent. Absolutely not. Not one verse of scripture in the Bible says only God can judge. I haven't judged everybody. I just judged him, yeah, because of what came out of his mouth. I judged him by his truth, like Jesus commands me to do. Yeah, see, you don't, you don't stick around to deal with your situation. The Bible never says only God can judge. Yeah, exactly. See, you, you can't deal with it. It's the truth. You hate the truth. You love your sin. That's the problem. That's the clarion cry of the sinner. Thou shalt not judge. Only God can judge. Never found in the Bible. But let's assume that's true for a second. Only God can judge. Do you really take, you take uh, comfort in that? That only God can judge you? 
I mean, think about it. I'm only judging what I see and hear in a very small flash of time. But God is going to judge you for everything. He sees it all. That should cause you to tremble, not take comfort. The fact that God is going to judge everything should cause you to tremble, not be comforted and keep on going on in your sin. I mean, do you really believe that? That God is going to judge it all? Going to judge your activities on this campus, your activities in your dorm room? What you do when no one's looking? I mean, if you really believe that, you would live differently than you are, wouldn't you? Unless, of course, you're living a holy life. If you're living a wicked life and you really think God's going to judge everything, you would stop living a wicked life. And then I would have nothing to judge myself. But so many people, they love to say things like, only God can judge, you can't judge me, because they want to be left alone in their sin. They want to be, quote-unquote, at peace in their sin. They want no disruption from their sin. No detraction from their sin. But I'm here to tell you, the most loving thing anyone can do for you is disrupt you in your sin. To distract you from your sin, to get you to repent of your sin. It's the most loving thing anyone could do for you. You may call it hate, but God calls it love. To tell someone the truth about themselves and call them to repentance is love. That's not hatred. That's love. And most times when people tell me I'm judging them, all I'm doing is telling them what the Bible says. But telling you what the Bible says is not judging you. That's telling you the truth. That's warning you to flee the wrath that's to come. To stop being a sinner. You know, Jesus Christ said, go and sin no more. He said, stop sinning lest a worse thing happen to you. So Jesus Christ said, and if Jesus Christ said it, I believe it and obey it. And that's what you should be doing too. Jesus Christ tells you to do something. There should be no question of, oh, why, Lord? Why well, do I have to do that? It should be, okay, how, how long? How much? How far? Because Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the judge of judges. And he's going to seize everything you're doing and thinking and saying. If anyone among you thinks he's religious, but does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. And his religion is useless. That's what the scriptures say. But a tongue is a so it sets the world on fire. It's one of the smallest muscles in the body, but one of the most powerful muscles in the body is the tongue. Proverbs 18 says the tongue can bring life or death. What does your tongue bring today? Life or death? Death through your filthy language? Or life through preaching Jesus Christ and preaching his word? Yes, most of you don't control your tongues. Because you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Your tongue just wags around in the wind like a flag, saying whatever comes out of your heart. Now, Jesus Christ said whatever comes out of the mouth is the overflow of the heart. At abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, the evil treasure, evil things. But I say unto you, for every idle word men may speak, they'll give an account of in day of judgment. For by your word you shall be justified, and by your word you shall be condemned. And what Jesus is literally saying there is, your heart condemns you or justifies you. Because what comes out of your mouth reveals the state of your heart. If you worship a God besides the God of the Bible, then that condemns you. That's idolatry. You show the state of your heart. You show you're not right with God. If you're a sodomite or a lesbian, you show you're not right with God. If you're a drunkard or a pot smoker, you show you're not right with God. If you idolize sports or 
musicians or actors or actresses, you show you're not right with God. But all those things can change in a moment of time. But the Bible calls you to give up your sin. Repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. That's what he offers you. Times of refreshing from his presence, your sins blotted out, your sins pardoned, your sins forgiven. That's what God offers you. But you reject that and go on in your sin anyway. Shame on you. Yes, Jesus Christ expects your all. Complete surrender. Utter devotion to him who died for you. To other people, these other quote-unquote gods you idolized, they have done nothing for you. But Jesus Christ has, and they can do nothing for you. They have no power to forgive you of your sins, to give you eternal life. But Jesus Christ does. And he offers it to you today through his shed blood. So the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, he who does not believe is condemned already. He has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Bible says no other name given under heaven by which he must be saved besides Jesus Christ. Allah can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Other millions of Hindu gods can save you. The quote-unquote God of Joseph Smith can't save you, but Jesus Christ can save you. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. As the Old Testament says, I've given you the blood upon the altar to make atonement for your sins, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. So really, when Christ died on the cross, he's offering his life for your life. He gets what he doesn't deserve in order that you might get what you don't deserve, the mercy and grace of God. But if you reject Jesus Christ, God will give you what you deserve, an eternity in hell. That's what every sinner deserves. Bows that every liar shall have his part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Every liar. You don't have to be a murderer, a rapist, or a Muslim terrorist to go to hell. You just have to be a liar. That's it. Just a liar. You don't have to be a pedophile to go to hell. You just have to be a liar and a covetous person. You don't have to be a serial killer to go to hell. You just have to be lustful. You don't have to rape women to go to hell. You just have to be a porn watcher. You don't have to be a drunkard to go to hell. You can just be a liar. The things that you think are small are big. And contrary to popular opinion, being judgmental and being intolerant are not necessarily sinful, let alone the worst sins in the world. Now, Jesus Christ was intolerant. Jesus Christ was judgmental. He called people whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. He called people brood of vipers. He said, you travel over land and sea to make a convert and make him twice the son of hell as you. Some harsh words. Jesus pronounced woes upon whole cities. It's pretty harsh, Jesus. 
But that's the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible turned over the tables, the money changers' tables, at least twice in the temple courts. That's the Jesus of the Bible. You know, the Bible, Jesus is called the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God, it takes away the sins of the world. But in Revelation 6, it paints a different picture of a Lamb named Jesus. When all the kings of the earth and all the sinners of the earth, they see his return, they say, fall on us, mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That's Jesus Christ when he returns. Not going to be a pretty picture for sinners. But that's exactly why God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And the Bible says God takes delight in the death of his saints. If you die as a Christian, a saint, you go to be with God. If you die as a sinner, you're going to end up in a lake of fire forever where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. Doesn't have to be that way for you. But if you're a sinner in your current stance, what's going to happen to you? But Christ can set you free. Doesn't matter how much your sin is, how great your sin is, how many times you've sinned, how bad your sin is, Christ is able to cleanse you. The Bible says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. Yeah, Christ can wash away your sins. He can cleanse you of your sins. But you've got to repent. You've got to truly give them up. You know, God doesn't fall for those fake prayers you pray after you're done sinning, and you're still planning to keep on doing it. God doesn't fall for that. You're just a hypocrite when you do that. And God's going to send hypocrites to the same place he sends liars and fornicators and thieves and drunkards and murderers to hell. But you know, when God originally made hell, he didn't even make it for humans. He made it for the first beings that decided to sin against him, the devil and his angels. But God will send humans to hell as well because they reject his authority, his rulership in their life and live whatever way they want and think they're so wise and so smart and really they're just fools. If you're running your life, you're rebelling against God, you're a fool. You're not wise. You may think you're smart, but you're not. What a dangerous place to be in. In your sins, doing what you want, rejecting God and the counsel of his word. What a dangerous place to be in. Having sex outside of marriage, getting drunk, dressing immodestly, having filthy lambs come out of your mouth, especially taking God's name in vain. It's a bad place to be in. Well, with Jesus, everything can be different. You can become born again of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Yes, Christ can change you. He can transform you. You can be holy. You can be pure. If you really want to be. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? You'd rather have your sin than have Jesus. You'd rather be a drunkard and a pot smoker than have Jesus. 
I'd rather be a sports idolater and a video game idolater than have Jesus Christ. You know, we all only have 24 hours every day. But I wonder how you're spending your 24 hours. How much of it is wasted, how much of it is used properly. You're wasting your life on books that come against what the scripture says. That's a waste of time. If you waste your time in front of ungodly television shows, that's a waste of time. You spend your time in front of the YouTube watching wicked videos, that's a waste of your time. The Bible says, see then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You need to redeem the time. Stop wasting your time, your precious time. You may not have much time left. You have no idea how much time you have left. If you're spending your time on sin, not spending your time doing things for the glory of God, then you're wasting your time. The Bible says, whatever, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or... So the Bible says even the small things, eating and drinking, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. But even the big things, people don't... People refuse to submit those things to God's will, to glorify God. Scripture goes on to say, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Can you say that about everything you've done today? Everything you said today or thought today, are you doing it all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Giving thanks to God the Father through him? Not if you're in sin, you can't. But there is a hope for sinners, a hope for sinners in repentance. It's a hope for sinners in humbling yourself. You need to humble yourself. Realize you're deserving of the judgment and wrath of God. You need to humble yourself and realize you're not on your way to God's kingdom. You're not forgiven by God if you're still living in sin. But that can change. Christ wants it to change. He can help you change. You don't have to be a sinner. You don't have to be wicked. You can be holy. You can be pure. You can be what God made you to be. And God did not make you to be a sinner. You're not born a sinner. You weren't created a sinner. You've chosen to be a sinner. And you need to choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to keep on serving your sin? Or are you going to start serving Jesus Christ? Who died for you. Probably one of the best educations you'll get all semester. Not because of me, because I'm preaching to you God's Word. And most of you don't open your Bibles, if you even have one. What a shame it is. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Can't say that about any book you got in your backpack. No book you got in your backpack, unless you got a Bible in your backpack, no book in your backpack is inspired by God. No book in your backpack can you say it was inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the Bible, the Holy Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down by holy men of old, that it might transform you from being unholy to being holy. You might say, well, I don't have faith. Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You don't have faith, pray God, give it to you and open the Bible. Read the Bible. what God wants you to do. Read the scriptures. See what it says. 
Obey what you read. The Bible is not some old, boring, dusty book. Unless you love your sin so much, you don't care about it. It's the most important book you'll ever read. More important than any history book, science book, English book, or whatever you're majoring in here at this campus. What do you mean by that? I just mean like, like what are you out here to do really? Preach the truth. And to try to get them to believe it? Well, it's up to them if they believe it or not. So you're just trying to throw the truth out there and make sure they know it? So they have, to, they have the choice at least? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I'm preaching the Word of God, but they might combine it with faith and, be, and repent mm -hmm. and be changed. That's their choice. I can't make them choose that. Right. Okay. I'm just curious why this type of stuff. That's what the Bible tells me to do. Yeah. But I, I just have a different approach to it myself. I, I, I think having relationships with people and then going about it slowly is what it works. But, I mean, this... That's actually not biblical. That's nowhere found in the Bible. That idea, that doctrine, that even that model is found nowhere in Scripture. I'm a strong believer and I feel like that's who God has created me for. Well, feelings don't matter. What matters is the truth. And God's never told you to do that. Well, that's just not okay. Just not what? Yeah, do you believe the Bible? I don't, think, I don't think Jesus would be doing this. I don't think he would be out yelling at people like this. That's what he did. So you, don't even, you must not know the Bible then. That's what Jesus did. People, people of today's world will not. They'll just laugh at you and just keep talking. Oh, so the Bible has to change because the world changes. No, but I, I think you should change and help these people. I am like, helping them by preaching the Bible to them. But they're not going to change their mind just by yelling at them. I'm not yelling at anybody. Just by preaching the truth like this, they're not going to change their mind. Well, that's not the Bible says. You just call the Bible a liar. No, Bible is God's word. I'm not calling the Bible a liar. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Is that true? Yes. So then I'm preaching the word of God and they can be saved by hearing it and, and believing it. They hear it, they don't have to believe it. They don't have to believe what you say either. Five months later, they don't have to believe what you say either. So if I get it done right away, you wait five months, they could have died in that time. And went to hell, because you said nothing to them. I just think this doesn't do any difference. Yeah, but your thinking doesn't make a difference if it doesn't, isn't based upon the scripture. Well, I know, I know for a fact. Because I'm walking in, I'm hearing people just laughing at you and stuff. So them laughing at me means I'm not doing anything wrong? No, Did it laugh at Jesus? Did it laugh at Jesus? It means that it's not working. Did it laugh at Jesus? Okay, so I guess he was doing something wrong according to you, too. Look, I'm not saying this is the wrong thing to do. <laughs> That's what you've been saying the whole time. No, I'm not. You're saying that what I'm doing is wrong. It is wrong. It's not biblical. What I'm doing is biblical, and you're coming against it. All right. Stop, being a, stop having fear of man and fear of God instead. Your prayers mean nothing. It's not based upon the Scripture. You're going to pray for me to something anti-scriptural? God's not going to hear that prayer. Well, I was earlier. Oh. Uh, they just had so many people on this campus that, like, everyone like, keeps saying, like, God hates everybody. Oh, I don't, think, I don't think God hates and, everybody. Like, there was some, it was, like, I think two years ago, some people just walked by, and instead of, like, telling them, like, why, he was just calling them out on things, and uh, I was, like, I don't know, that's totally the right way to go. It was, like, because I, I believe in, like, you know, welcoming in arms and whatnot. And I was, like, he was just yelling at them, saying, you're going to hell, yeah, it's probably true, but he was not doing it like, because he was getting angry up by the other people. They were protesting him for some reason, I don't know why. Oh. Like, they had like people out and he started getting like flustered and everything. Oh, okay. I was, well, like, you definitely have to walk according to the spirit when you're doing this. I saw you sure. here and you were just talking to people and I was like. Well, what? I was preaching earlier too. Well, that's, that's one that's one thing, but I'm talking about like, you know, people just yelling people out. That always like, that's all I hear, it just always pushes people away and I was like. Doesn't always help, but I saw you do when I walked out. You just talked to some guy here. I was like, I like that better than most people's done. Here. Well, preaching's not comfortable with people. No, nah, my dad's a preacher actually. So okay. That's why I was just like, I just want to okay. thank you for just being on campus. Okay. And some people need to know. Amen. Definitely need to know for sure. Well, thanks for coming, anyways. Man. Okay.
Okay. Kerrigan. Awesome. I speak to Jordan. Hey, have a good day, man. Amazing how what happens when you stay quiet for a few minutes. People don't mind the filthy music blaring as you go by, but if someone starts to preach out loud, then they have a problem with the hypocrites. The Bible says that God commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Many of you spent lots of time preparing for this semester, getting the right clothes, getting your dorm room set up just the right way, getting the right supplies for school, preparing for this semester. But very few of you prepare for Christ's return. Filthy mouth. What a filthy mouth you have. Very few of you prepare to be judged by God. Well, you don't have to go to hell. But if you're a sinner, you're currently on your way to hell. That's correct. But no one's making you go there. It's your choice to keep on sinning. Nobody else is. God doesn't make you sin, that's for sure. Yes, no one forces you to go to hell. But guess what? No one forces you to go to God's kingdom either. And unfortunately, the default position for most people is hell. Because they'd rather be sinners then obey God. They'd rather have sex outside of marriage, be sodomites and lesbians. They'd rather be drunkards and, and liars and thieves than actually obey God, as God commands you to do. Yes, obedience is required. No entrance to God's kingdom is allowed except for those who give up their sin and follow Jesus Christ. If you're still living in sin, you're not following Jesus because he doesn't lead people to sin. Jesus Christ leads people to be holy, not to be sinners. Jesus Christ will never lead you to be a homosexual. And he's never made a homosexual either. Now I understand some people who are homosexuals have been sexually molested when they were younger. They've been uh, abused in some way. You know, but God can free you from that. God can bring you to the point where you will forgive the people who abused you. And God still cares for you and loves you. And wants you to be in relationship with Him. But see, all sin does is condemn you. All sin does is damn you to hell. That's all it can do. It can't go any further than that. It can't help you one bit. But the grace and mercy of God can free you from damnation and condemnation, can free you from the guilt and shame of sin, can cleanse you from all sin and unrighteousness, the blood of Jesus Christ. But most people would rather stay filthy, unfortunately. The scripture says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Yes, don't deceive yourself. Don't hear the word of God today and walk away and not care. Don't hear the word of God today and walk away and think it's no big deal and be apathetic towards the word of God. The word of God is sent forth to change you. The Word of God is a seed according to Scripture, and it wants to go into the soil of your heart and bring forth a tree of righteousness. But the soil of your heart must be ready and prepared for the seed of the gospel. And for you to have a heart that's prepared for the seed of the gospel, you must have a humble heart, a teachable heart. As the Bible says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Must be humble, poor in spirit. Yes, you need Jesus Christ on the first day. 
Not just the last day. Every day you need Jesus Christ. And this is the first day of classes. Praise the Lord. You got a good start to your day by hearing the Word of God, whether you like it or not. And yeah, the most important knowledge, understanding you could ever have is of God's Word. And the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And by the fear of God, one departs from iniquity. The scripture said, if you fear God, you'll keep His commandments. This world definitely needs more of the fear of God. This college campus definitely needs more of the fear of God. You need more of the fear of God in your life and less of love for sin. Why would you love something so much that will harm you? You know, a sinner's love for sin can be likened to a woman's love for a man who beats her and rapes her. A woman who loves and wants to be in relationship with a man who beats her and abuses her verbally, physically, and rapes her is foolish. You all know that. But infinitely more foolish is your love for sin, which will send you to hell in the end. Well, sin will make you miserable in eternity, but it also makes you miserable right now. Sin makes you miserable in eternity and right now. Yeah, sin may feel good for a season. Sin may feel good when you're doing it, but afterward the guilt and shame comes, the condemnation comes, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, and your conscience comes. And you got nothing to do with it. Many of you engage in sexual immorality, think you're going to find love there, but all you do is walk away empty and lonely still. Because you weren't made for sexual immorality. You're made for purity. If you want to engage in sexual activity at all, it should be within marriage, between a male and a female monogamous marital relationship. Any other kind of sexual activity is against God's will. It's outside the boundaries he's created. And since he's the one who's created sexuality, he's the one who has the ability to make the rules regarding it. So many of you step out of those boundaries, you step into the judgment and wrath of God, the condemnation, the guilt and shame. But it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to follow the rest of the world to hell. You can be right with God instead. You don't have to keep on sinning. You don't have to be a drunkard like the rest of this campus for the most part. You don't have to keep on smoking weed and smoking cigarettes. You don't have to keep on being a liar and a thief and a covetous person. You don't have to keep on lusting after people or watching pornography on the internet. You can be pure. You can be holy and righteous and good. According to God's standard, the only standard that matters. When you stand before God on Judgment Day, He's not going to judge you according to this world standard, but according to His standard. His perfect and holy standard, found in the Scripture, in the Bible, God's Word. You know, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever. And not one jot nor one tittle will pass away until all things are fulfilled. You know, Jesus Christ came the first time as a babe in a manger. The second time he's coming as a conquering king to destroy his enemies. You don't want to be his enemy on that day. But if you're a sinner, you're an enemy of God. The scripture says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The scriptures say adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore is a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. By being just like the world around you, by being just like this wicked place, you make yourself an enemy of God. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be an enemy of God. You can be a friend of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through repentance, through forgiveness and cleansing. You can be made right with God today. 
just takes you humbling yourself. The Bible says, whoever covers his sin shall not prosper, but who confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. As God wants you to find mercy today, but it takes you confessing your sins and forsaking your sins. And going on in your sins, covering up your sins, you're just fooling yourself. There's no mercy for you. It takes humility to receive the mercy of God. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. There's many people who you'll meet who will claim to have the grace of God, but they're living in sin every day. So they prove to you and to everyone else around them, they really don't have the grace of God. Because the grace of God that brings salvation teaches you to live holy right now in this present age. Anything else is false grace, false mercy. There's a greasy grace going on to slippery slide right into hell. Jude talks about these false teachers who crept in unnoticed, who long ago their condemnation was written about. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. Many supposed pastors and churches these days will teach you, well, you can't live holy. You can't uh, repent of your sins truly. You have to sin. It's impossible to stop sinning. That's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. God says the exact opposite. Jesus Christ commands you to go and sin no more. He commands you to stop sinning. He commands you to repent. To go the other way. But if you keep on going down the road of sin, it's going to end up in hell. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Which path are you on? Which gate have you walked through? Have you gone through the wide gate or on the broad road that leads to destruction? Or have you walked through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ on a difficult path that leads to life? You know, the path that leads to life is not easy. It's difficult. You go against the tide. You're like a salmon trying to go back to their home and lay their eggs. You're going against the tide. It's difficult to live holy in a wicked world. But it can be done. You can do what is right in God's eyes all the days of your life. The scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Bible says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Yes, you know that your sinning is wrong against God. You know your sex outside of marriage is wrong. You know your lust and your drunkenness and your pot smoking is wrong. You know your perversion is wrong. You know your porn watching and your lying is wrong. And your lust. But you do it anyway. Why? Because you love it. Not because you love God. Because you love your sin. But you're just deceiving yourself. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, not only do not be a son of disobedience, but also don't be partakers with the sons of disobedience. And the Bible says... 
Bad company corrupts good character. That old saying, you become who you hang around, is true. What fellowship does light have with darkness, the Bible says? None. That's the answer. The light has no fellowship with the darkness. They don't coexist together in the same spot in the same time. But when you come to a wicked university as a Christian, hang around wicked people, you're going to be wicked yourself. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If you're a sinner, you have no inheritance in Christ's kingdom. But that can change. You don't have to continue to be a sinner. You don't have to keep on walking the way you're walking, living the way you're living, talking the way you're talking, thinking the way you're thinking. Christ can change you. I know he's changed me and many others who I know. I used to be a fornicator and a drunkard myself and a liar and a potty mouth and a fighter, impatient, lustful, porn watcher, but Christ changed me. And now I don't do those things any longer. Now I live holy. And it comes naturally to me because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and has changed me and transformed me. You know, Jesus Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? It must be pretty important if you can't see the kingdom of God without becoming born again. Becoming born again means you forsake your sins, you trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. And that's forsaking all sin. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you and changes you from the inside out. That's what it means to be born again. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be transformed from the inside out. So you'll speak differently, you'll think differently, you'll act differently, you'll dress differently. You'll do different things with your time. That's what happened to me 20 years ago. Probably longer than some of you have been alive. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so His promises don't change. And the fear of God is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Yeah, many people see the fear of God as a bad thing. They don't want to fear God. Why should I fear God? Shouldn't I just love God? Well, they're really synonymous terms. If you fear God, you love God. If you love God, you fear God. It's like you should love and fear your parents. You should love them. You should fear them if they, you do something wrong. Unless your parents are negligent, of course. But I know when I was young, if I did something wrong, I feared my father because I knew I was in trouble. But I still loved them. In fact, it was my love for him that caused me to fear him. At the same way it is with God. People say, why should I fear God? Well, he created this whole earth and all that is in it, including you. But let's face it, you and I, we're, we're specks of dust on the face of this planet. You can fit over a million of our planet into our sun. And our sun, comparatively speaking, is very small compared to other stars in this universe, and God created them all innumerable amount of stars and God created them all and most of them are about a million times the size of our sun well maybe not most of them but some of them are and God created them all I think those facts are sufficient reason for you to fear God especially if you're a sinner if you're a sinner you have every reason to fear God 
fear his judgment, his wrath, his punishment, his chastisement. You can't laugh it off. He's not going away. You won't be held Satan in hell, sinner. He's not going away. He's not changing his mind. He has appointed a day, judgment day. And all you who hail Satan and whether you say it verbally with your mouth or live that way practically with your life, you're in danger. You're in trouble. I'm here today to warn you. Flee the wrath that's to come. Give up all your sin. Don't go to hell. Don't get what you deserve for your sin, the wrath of God. Well, you'll go to hell. And you won't love it then, sinner. You won't love it then. But you don't have to be a mockery, a scoffer. You don't have to be cool in front of your friends or be apathetic or prideful. You can humble yourself instead. You can give up your sins instead. You can escape the judgment and wrath of God through the mercy of Jesus Christ. You know, you could actually try proving that your God exists instead of just asserting that he does. I don't have to prove God exists. You know he does and so do I. No, actually, and you don't need any more proof than you already have. I actually don't know God Yeah, you do. You're lying to yourself. You're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. You don't want God to exist because you're a sinner. What's that? I don't have to prove it. So the Bible says it's God's word and God's not a liar like you are. You're making a positive claim. You are claiming that I have knowledge of God. Yes. I am telling you. Because God says so. And God's not a liar like you are. I'm not lying. Sir, you're just you're lying. being very blind. You're not following. Prove it. Exactly. You can't prove it. God loves you no matter what turn up they have. Wrong. Does God love the people he sends in hell? Prove it. Does God love the does God love Go people? Ahead and prove it. I'm trying to. Go if you, ahead and prove it. yeah, I didn't think you'd be quiet. You know, I can prove it. Yeah. Does God love those who are going to be in hell forever? So the scripture says. What the scripture says. Yeah, I have before, but not anymore. I'm living holy now. No, no, I've repented. I've trusted in Christ. I'm born again of the Holy Spirit. I live for Him now. And that's the same promise God has for you. I am holy. No, I am holy. Yeah. I am holy. That's what I just said a second ago. Maybe you weren't listening. Yes, I am living a holy life. Hey, but you're right. If I wasn't and I was telling you to be holy, I'd be hypocritical. You are being no, no, that's not what I'm doing. How am I being unholy? Because you're trying to spread faith through fear. That's not what faith is. Okay. Faith is your own beliefs. Well, Jesus said. People are not going to turn to God sinfully and purely out of fucking fear of hell. So says the potty mouth. I don't take advice from you, sinner. Jesus Christ yeah, said. Well, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. The words of Jesus Christ. You dismissed me for being a potty mouth, but you're the only one spreading damning information. Well, it's the truth. The truth may damn you, but it's the truth nonetheless. And you don't have to like it. No, I know I'm not. Because I've trusted in Jesus Christ. I've been cleansed of all my past sins. I'm living a holy life. The very thing God commands you to do if you want to be saved. But listen, if you're still in your sins, you're still getting drunk, fornicating, lying, stealing, smoking pot. Listen, you're in danger. That's why I'm here to warn you. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to get right with God. And no, the thing is, no matter how much sinning you've done, no matter how big or how small your sin may be, God can cleanse you. He can forgive you. He can change you like he's done for me. The same promise, that same thing he's done for me, he can do for you. But you've got to repent. You've got to give up your sin. You can't hold on to your sin straight to the grave and end up in hell. You have to give up your sin. Why? Okay, sir, you were the one that claimed that there is 
No, Senator, I didn't say that. That's your mockery. That's not what I've said. I've never said that. I never said there's a space wizard in the sky. Yes, God will punish the wicked with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glorious power. What the scripture abundantly says over and over again. I know you don't like it. I know you love your sin and your pride more than you love God. But it's a fact of the matter. No. Yep. I, va no, I, value, I value information that I can verify and actually. Verify with what? That, that I can actually show to be true. How can you show it to be true? Well, I can't show that your God exists. Well, well what? I can't, I can't You're still not answering my question. How does someone show something to be true, young man? You can, How? Okay, so for example, with the, the Higgs boson, we know that if you smash... Uh, no, you're giving me an example. I'm asking you how. You're misunderstanding my question, young man. I'm asking you how. Now, go give me an example of, of what you think you know is true. I'm asking you how do you know something is true? What is your epistemology? How do you know what you know? If, it can be, if, it, if you can repeatedly verify that so, something to be the case, that as far as I'm concerned is true. So it's scientific experimentation? Yeah, scientific method. Okay. That's so the scientific that's method, that's which... Method. Well, that's what you say. No, that is, no, it is. No, that's what you say. Do you have all knowledge? Do you have all knowledge? No, I don't. You have a very small percentage, don't you? Less than 1%, like most of us. Okay, so then how do you know it's the best method? Well, I, I might, but I'm not the one making universal claims about the best way to find knowledge. You're the one doing that, not me. Okay, so you don't know if it's the best way. It's the best way you know of. Yeah, it's the best way that we... That you know of. No, that you know of. That you know of. No, that we as a society know of. So, but the scientific experimentation... Science has taken us from communicating over periods of days and weeks with parchment like quill to sending terabytes of data halfway around the world on sun feet. It has taken us from navigating our world on ships of wood and cloth to sailing across vast spaces of nothingness it hasn't made you righteous, though. Hasn't made you righteous, though. It has hasn't made you right with God, though. But hasn't made you right with God. You're still a sinner, though. And so the scientific method assumes... Young man, listen for a second. Listen for a second. Listen, listen. Hey, 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 listen. The scientific method assumes lots of things. Number one, it assumes... Hey, 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 don't talk to him. This is public property. I don't need your consent. Freedom of press. No, freedom of press. Public property. Go talk to your supervisor. Go talk to the cop if you want to. They'll tell you the same thing I'm telling you. It's called the Constitution. I don't need their permission. It's freedom of press and public property. Walk away if you want to be on camera. Walk away. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Walk away. That this was going on. It doesn't have to be publicly posted. I'm right here. You're walking by. Walk away if you want to. But it assumes lots of things. It assumes, one, that there is uniformity in nature. And in fact, science experimentation looks for uniformity because it assumes uniformity. Hold on, let me finish before you respond. It also assumes that your five senses are working properly in order to engage in experimentation, which you haven't proven that. It also assumes that the past and the present has some bearing on the future. It assumes a principle of induction. So there's three things that science assumes at least is uniformity in nature, that the principle of induction and your five senses are working properly. And none of those things can be proven. And you can't prove any of that either. So you know nothing. Okay, well at least you're being honest now. Why, I thought you only believe what you prove. I thought you only believe what you can prove. Well, that's because you have no argument. So you only believe what you can prove, but you can't prove anything, therefore you believe nothing.
Like what? How do you know that? But once again, you're involving yourself in scientific experimentation, which you can't prove works. So you're back to square one. You assume a lot of things to engage in science. And those things cannot be proven, and you told me yourself, you only believe what can be proven. Therefore, you believe in nothing. In fact, you don't even know if you believe that or not, because you can't know anything. I know what you've told me. I know what you've told me. I know what you've told me. Don't I? Okay, so then I know something about you. That's all I need to know. All I need to know is how you know what you know. You've already told me that. And I've come to the conclusion that you should too, if you're logical, that you know nothing. What do you know? And how do you know it? Because it can be repeatedly verified. Science. How do you know that science works? I've just, I've just shown you. It's, it, okay, so GPS, the, the, the ability to make things like elevated. It's called begging the question. Hey, what do you think about Charlie Brown? Philosophically, young man, it's called begging the question. All of these things are the fruit Personally, of the science. Personally, I think the best. If you base the design of, of cars on science, they fly. But wait a minute. You said earlier that you, as, you assume you exist. But you said earlier you assume you exist, right? Don't you assume you exist? Do you know you exist? And if you don't know you exist, do you know those things exist? And if you don't know you exist, do you know those things exist? So you know nothing. Once again, we're back to square one. It's a self contradictory position, young man, to not believe in God and try to know something. The fact is, God is the fountainhead of all knowledge, all understanding. That's your wicked uh, way of looking at it, but they weren't ignorant. They revealed lots of things that you don't know of before through, before their time. What'd you say? They believe that Absolutely not. The Bible does not teach a flat earth. I don't care what you've heard or what you hear other people say. Not teach a flat earth. Teach a sphere. Not teach a flat earth. Well, you can misinterpret the Bible all you want, young man. It's not the way the Bible reads, though. There isn't one Bible verse that supports that nonsense. Really? So you're saying the earth isn't flat, balanced to top the backs of four elephants who ride a turtle through space? That's mythology. Uh, I think they're made out of cotton. To this but even if they were cotton and polyester, the Bible doesn't forbid right. that. Yes, it does. No, actually, it, actually it forbids for Jewish people the wearing of wool and linen together. I'm not Jewish, nor do I wear wool and linen together, let alone them by themselves. Okay. Typically wear cotton and polyester. But I'm not a Jew, I'm a Christian. No, it's not irrelevant. It's good history, but it doesn't apply to me. Not all the Bible applies to me. This is all New Testament. Yeah, all this New Testament scripture. And like three of them, thieves, liars, and fornicators, Jesus hung out with them. So I don't know. I'm hanging out with them right now. I'm just like Jesus. You're Jesus? No, no, I'm just like him. Jesus! Oh my God! I know it's hard to get confused. I know it's hard to get confused, but I'm not Jesus. There goes a liar right there. That's a liar right there. No, now you lied. No, we no, we're not lying. Yeah. That, that's what we've learned from our experience. What experience is that? Well, I've, well, I've been to well, I've been to one of your talks before. You got up on a soapbox and got on your high horse and started asserting things that weren't true. Prove it. Prove it's not true. Prove anything I've asserted today is not true. Say you don't have any proof. You make a, you made bold assertions yourself and can't prove it's true. No one's looking for you to hit me. 
you liars. Hey, but listen, every time you sin against God, you shake your fist in his face and he's not going to put up with it for good. You haven't proven he isn't. I don't have to. It's impossible to prove a negative. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Not impossible to prove a negative. You have to have one bit of knowledge. No, 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 no. If you have one bit of knowledge. No, no, that's not true. I don't believe that either. To disprove what I believe, you have to prove something that contradicts it. That's all. Be proven nothing that contradicts it. Yeah, you're not making the assertions. Yes, the God of the Bible commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And here we are in the first day of the semester and you're not ready to meet God. Second? Okay, I stand, mis I stand mistaken there. I'm a second day. I heard someone say earlier it was the first day. Okay, so some didn't have classes yesterday is what you're saying. Absolutely not. I preach the whole Bible, goodness and severity of God. Are you preaching? At all? Well, I meant you're, you're coming against me for preaching wrong, supposedly, but you're not preaching at all. It kind of makes you a hypocrite, doesn't it? It doesn't? Oh, it does, okay. Who said I can't shout? Okay. It's sinful to shout? Is it sinful to shout? Okay. Did Jesus shout? Did Jesus shout? Okay, so then there's nothing wrong with shouting. But you said a signal, that's what's wrong, is I'm shouting at people. So it's wrong to have a bad tone of voice? Where does the Bible say that? Yeah. Because you're, you're calling it a sin, so I want to know where the Bible says that. Oh, so then I'm not doing anything wrong then. Is, is being uncourteous sinful? So then it, and you're calling it sinful still. So please show me where having a bad tone of voice and shouting at people is sinful. Oh, yeah, he sure did when he cursed the Elemist, the sorcerer. Did he do? Did you? Did you do anything wrong? When Paul was cursing Elemis the sorcerer. Okay, so then why are you coming against me? Well, no, this, there's lots of sorcerers here. They're engaging in smoking weed. They're coming against the preaching of God's word. What was Elemis's problem? Paul was preaching to the pro council, and he tried to stop him from preaching to him. That's what the problem he had. So Paul cursed him with blindness. I'm not cursing anybody with blindness. I'm just preaching the word of God. You know what I think the problem is? I think you, you fear man more than you fear God. You care more about what a man thinks than what God thinks. That's the problem. I don't think I have any problems. So I'm in sin. What's wrong with my character? Okay, you're going back to that again, but you still haven't proven that the how I'm doing it is wrong or sinful. Huh? With God's word on it? Is the material sinful? Love you, babe. Stay hot. Are the colors sinful? It's mostly. Is this pole sinful? It's mostly the presentation. What's, how, how is it presented wrong? So, so here's the, thing. the colors? Here's, here's the thing. Is it the font? Wait, I have an honest question. Is the font sinful? Yeah, that's pretty good. You're, you know, you're making no sense. You're, you're just trying to find a way to make me do something wrong when I'm not doing anything wrong. You just feel uncomfortable because the sinners don't like what I'm doing. I, I have that's what it boils down to. Because I'm not very familiar with the Bible. Uh, where did it say that Muslims are going to go to hell? Idolaters are going to hell. They're idolaters. They worship a different God besides the God of the Bible. They're idolaters. 
I mean, I could have put Jehovah Witnesses on here and Mormons on here and Seventh Day Adventists and. Don't like Muslims, not about me liking them or not. In fact, if I didn't like them, I wouldn't put them on there. I'm warning them. I'm warning them that they need to flee the wrath that's to come. That they don't go to hell. I don't want them to go to hell. That's why I put them on here and warn them. But like I said I could have put, I could put Hindus on there, Buddhists on there, but I'm trying to be as relevant as possible. I mean, I run to more Muslims than anybody else. Why would you put Buddhists on there? It's a philosophy. They'd be like Confucius. Well, it's a philosophy that's anti-Christ. It's a philosophy according to... There's nothing in it that's anti-Christ. Yes, it is. Because Buddha himself and what he taught was nothing like what Christ taught. Buddha taught that you shouldn't starve yourself, nor should you live in luxury, that you should Did Buddha teach to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? He doesn't need to talk about God. That's like, my problem. What I'm the, saying is he's a philosopher, not a religious person. Yeah, but his philosophy is anti-Christ, that was saying. philosophy never has anything to do with religion. It, that's part of the problem. It's, it's, it's anti-Christ. Okay, so it, would you say people who, who ascribe to the, uh, oh, what's it called? The Stoic philosophy, they're anti-Christ because their philosophy doesn't mention God? Well, no, Buddha's not just talking about, he's talking about morality, too. Nothing not just philosophy. The scripture teaches there's a philosophy according to the traditions of this world, and there's a philosophy according to Christ. No, they're not. Not even close. No, actually, they don't incorporate, and that's the foundation of Christianity. Loving God, knowing God, following Jesus Christ. A Christian originally you had to be Jewish. Absolutely not. Yes. Absolutely not. Yes, absolutely. The Christians were originally called Jews in Antioch where they were both Jews and Gentiles. And and, it, and that was dealt with early on that Jews Jews said that Gentiles did not have to become Jews in Acts 15 in order to be a Christian. They added that in Yeah, he was. All the early Christians were Jews, but you don't have to be a Jew to be a Christian, that's what he was saying. You you agree with that, right? Okay, so I mean you should probably speak up and say something then, if you believe that. You won't do it, will you? They changed that. You won't speak up, will you? Just took Nothing got changed. Class. Nothing got we changed. spoke about the great philosophers of the same period, where all throughout this one period, philosophers rose up all, all over the place, including Jesus, who all preached the same values of love and charity and being kind to one another. Absolutely not. And not even yes, close to the same. Yes, they did. Not even close to the same. It all happened, and then we were speaking about why Christianity spread. And one of the big problems why it took Christianity a long while to get moving was that in order to convert to Christianity, if you were a Roman citizen, which is where the heart of Christianity sort of was back in those early days, you first had to become Jewish. Absolutely so not. They, if, well, you've history. been lied to. You've been lied to. This is historically what happened. That's historical it's revisionism is what that is. Back into historical Bible. revisionism. Because remember, Absolutely Bible, not. The New Testament of the Bible is still being written at this Have you read the Bible? Yes, I have read the Bible. And where is it in the Bible? It's in the New Testament. Where? In the New Testament. Where? In the New Testament. Where in the New Testament? I don't know all the books because I'm no longer a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that in the early beginnings you had to be a Jew to be a Christian. You've been lied to. You bought a lie. I didn't read that in the Bible. I learned that in history class where we have... And you've been told lies. ...primary sources that document this. What are these sources? What are these sources? Of course. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If he hasn't taken away your hold on, let me ask you a question. If he hasn't taken away your sins, you're still in your sins. And Isaiah 53 talks about Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, the Jewish prophet Isaiah talks about Jesus Christ. He says, he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You don't have forgiveness of sin. You don't have forgiveness of sin. And the Bible says you must be born again. If you're not trusting in Christ, you're not born again. Therefore, you are in sin. We're talking about the way you grew up. We're not talking about the way you grew up. I'm not that kind of guy. Listen, I was, I was raised Roman Catholic. I'm not Roman Catholic anymore. You don't have to be the way you were raised. Listen, I wasn't a Christian as a Roman Catholic. I went to church probably on the holidays. Okay? But I believe the Roman Catholic idea that if I was a good person, I would eventually go to heaven. God would forgive me of all my bad stuff. Wasn't true. It's the way I was raised. I didn't have to stay the way I was raised. You don't have to stay the way you're raised. Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists don't have to stay the way they're raised. In fact, all the time, people get converted to other religions. 
So the way you're raised has nothing to do with the way you end up. What do you mean by good person? What's not worth it? Hearing God's word? No, it's not worth listening to you. That's what you say. This is love. This is love. This is love. Now you're a liar. Now you're a liar. Now you're a liar. Just made yourself into a liar. Hey, but if you want to go away, have at it. I'm still going to be here. But you were saying if you're a good person. But here's the thing. The Bible says no one is righteous, no, not one. See, you and I, we've all sinned against God. All of us. So we're not good in that sense. In fact, in that sense, only God is good. Only God has never sinned. And so you need, just like I do, you need forgiveness of sins. And the only way God's provided for you to have forgiveness of sins is through Jesus Christ. No. No, no Leviticus 17.11 says this. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your soul. For there is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. In the Old Testament, they had a Jewish temple. They offered blood sacrifice to get forgiveness of sins. When Jesus Christ came, that temple was done away with. That sacrifice was done away with, and Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice for sins. That's why you have no temple now. You're even trying to rebuild another one in, in Jerusalem, but it's not going to make a difference. It's not going to change the facts that you need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. No animal sacrifice will do. God has done away with that. God established it, and he did away with it. That was the law of Moses. Now we have the law of love, the law of Christ, the royal law of liberty. And so you must trust in Christ. He's the, in fact, he came from the Jews. That's who he came to. He's the Jew, I mean, he came to the Jews before he came to the Gentiles. He's the Jewish Messiah. And as a Gentile, I, I make it one of my goals to provoke Jews to jealousy. I actually went to Jerusalem and preached in their streets as well. Because God came to you first. The Jews first. And you need to trust in your Jewish Messiah, your Savior. Isaiah 53, read it. It talks just about Jesus. And he came to save you and transform you and cleanse you. He can. Okay, well, God bless you. What's your name? Good to meet you. My name's Kerrigan. Yeah. The Christian like church is actually double Well, Muslims are turning away from Islam, that's why. Exactly. Yeah, I'm familiar with some of the works going on there, like FAI is going on there. And I've heard of uh, there's a, he's a uh, Christian uh, Arab, his name is Hazim uh, Haraj. Yeah. Uh, he's actually uh, he's actually been to Muslim. No, can't say I've heard of him. Well, uh, what he does is he goes around, uh, he was uh, raised in the U.S. <laughs> Hey, young man, I don't mean to interrupt you or be rude, but I really want to preach to these people. You and I can talk afterwards or something like that, okay? I, I'm not trying. I mean, what you're saying is important. I believe in those things, but I really want to preach to the people who are here. They might be saved. And the Bible says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. See, God is willing to abundantly pardon. He's willing to have mercy upon you. But you must seek him while he may be found.
You must call upon him while he is near. Forsake your wicked ways and your wicked thoughts and return to God. And he's willing to have mercy. He's willing to pardon. He's willing to cleanse. He's willing to forgive. But you must be willing to give up your sin. You must be willing to go and sin no more. Whatever your sin may be, lying, stealing, covetousness, lust, porn watching, sex outside of marriage, drunkenness, pot smoking, whatever it is, you need to give it up. It's going to cost you your soul. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the end? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If you are ashamed of me and my words, Jesus said, in this adulterous and sinful generation of you, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you're not ashamed of Jesus and you call yourself a Christian, you'll stand up, you'll preach his word, you'll stand up for righteousness, you'll preach his word, you'll read his word, you'll obey his word, you'll love his word. But so many people don't care about God's word, they'd rather read their textbooks. They'd rather watch TV or a movie or get on social media or YouTube. God's word's infinitely more important than any of those things. And your life ought to show it. Your life ought to show how important God's word is. The Bible says that God is worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. And if God is worthy to be praised, he's worthy of everything. Worthy of your whole life. Worthy of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God is worthy. Does your life reflect that fact? Does your life reflect the fact that God is worthy of your all? The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Does your life reflect that? Do you obey the greatest commandment? Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? If you're living in sin, you don't love God. If you love God, you won't be a sinner. If you're a sinner, you don't love God, and you're on your way to hell currently. But you can change your path today. Here we have today the narrow path intersecting with the broad path. And I'm on the narrow path calling upon you, those of you on the broad path, to come off the broad path that leads to destruction and get on the narrow and difficult path that leads to life. That's what God wants for you. God doesn't want you to end up in hell. God doesn't want to give you what you deserve for your sins. But he will do it if you refuse to repent, refuse to give up your rebellion and, and wave the white flag of surrender and lay down your sin and get right with God. God will give you what you deserve. But God's patient with you, long-suffering towards you, merciful towards you, not wanting you to perish, but wanting you to come to repentance. And the Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is giving up your sin. It's going the other way. It's turning around. It's making a 180 degree turn and going the opposite direction. If you're a drunkard, you'd be sober. If you're a liar, you'd be honest. If you're sexy and moral, you'd be pure. If you're covetous, you'd be content. That's what it means to repent, to give it up, to trust in Christ, to allow him to transform you from the inside out, that you might not end up in hell in the end. Oh, repent. Repent or perish, Jesus said. Give up your sin lest you go to hell for it. What sin is really worth going to hell over? Is your porn watching worth going to hell over? Is your idolatry of uh, actors, actresses, athletes, musicians, is that worth going to hell over? It is? Why? Come on, young man, you, you opened your mouth and proclaimed, let's go defend it. Why? Why is it worth it going to hell for those things? The Bible says you worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What a silly thing to do. To worship someone or something that was created by something even higher. 
common sense even tells you if someone created something, you wouldn't worship that thing. You worship the one who created it above the thing. And God created you and me. Oh, no show here, sinner. Just calling you to repentance. That's all. Just calling you to repentance. Calling you to give up your sin. If you want peace with God, you have to repent. There's no peace with God for the ungodly, for the wicked. No peace with God for the wicked. Jesus Christ said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Try and gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, the yoke of sin is hard. The burden of sin is heavy. And it will weigh you straight down to the lake of fire if you keep it up. Instead of continuing in sin, give up the hard yoke. Give up the heavy burden of sin. Trust in Christ. The light yoke or easy yoke, a light burden. Christ wants to give you mercy. Well, you may have done four, young man, but I've done most of them. Christ can change you. All these things have power over your life. You're enslaved to them, but Christ can deliver you from them all. From your sexual morality, from your drunkenness, from your potty mouth, from your pot smoking, you're lying and stealing. Christ can deliver you from it all if you give up your sin, if you surrender, if you humble yourself. You know, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. His eyes are on the ways of man. He sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Some of you come here to hide yourself from your parents, hide your ungodly activities from your parents and your friends back home because they don't know what you're like here, but God sees it. God sees it. And God's going to judge you. You ought to stop being so concerned with your parents' judgment and your friends' judgment. Be concerned with God's judgment. So on Judgment Day, God will judge you according to His perfect and holy standard. Not according to what your parents think, your church thinks, or other people think, according to what God thinks. You want to know what God thinks? Open the Bible and read it. That'll tell you what God thinks. It might. Well, you want to see yourself, go look in the mirror. You know what time it is? I only put so much time in the... Okay. Yeah, you only had 27 minutes left. Yeah. How you doing? How are you? Great. Blessed, favored. I sure am. Amazing how the hypocrites cheer for hell, but they won't start the fire now. You won't start the fire now, hypocrites. You don't really want to go to hell. You don't really want to go to hell. 
You mock hell, but hell will mock you in the end if you don't repent. If you're talking to me, I can't hear you. I think it was overblown, to be honest. Yeah. I saw one yesterday. Yeah, I thought it was cool, but I think it's overblown. I think people are making too much of it. Hey, there'll be another one in seven years. So what? I told a lie? When did I tell a lie? Yeah, there's going to be one in seven years. It's going to go through Texas and, and uh, Ohio. Hey, that's fine with me. I don't have to see an eclipse. I want to see the face of my Savior is all I care about. But if, yeah, if you're amazed by an eclipse, wait till Christ comes back and parts the sky. You'll be amazed then. When's he coming back? No one knows the day of the hour, the Bible says. What's that? Just because I don't know when he's coming back, I, mean, I don't know he's coming back. I know he's coming back. He said he's coming back. I don't have to know when. If your parents left the house, then I'll be back. Are you going to say, well, you're not really coming back. You didn't tell me what time you were coming back. No, you wouldn't call them liars. God's not a liar. Christ is going to return. He's going to part the sky. And when he returned with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll know I was telling you the truth. Jesus comes back as a thief in the night for those who are not ready, who are not waiting, watching, and praying, and living holy. It's going to be a thief in the night. You don't understand the meaning, do you? Absolutely not. None. Not at all. I used to be some of them. Used to be some of them. Not anymore. Yeah. I've done a lot of wickedness in my past. But I've repented of my sins. I, I plan to stay that way. Well, people are still in their sins. People who have repented, the two different things. I've repented. I've had, gotten mercy from God. I'm born again of the Holy Spirit. I live a holy life now. Well, they, that's what I'm telling them. I want them to repent. Right, that's part of it. And then you got the other side of the sign. Double-sided. Yeah, God wants you to have mercy. He doesn't want you to go to hell. I've been saying that all day. But listen, if you continue to mock and scoff and play with sin, you're going to end up in hell. You're playing with your soul. And every time you sin, you're closer to death and closer to hell. And young people think it's a big, big game. It's not a game at all. It's your soul, it's your life. It's where you're going to spend eternity. Where you're going to spend ever, forever. What's the Bible say of drinking? Getting drunk is a sin. Well, I, I think I made it clear. If you're getting drunk, you're a sinner on your way to hell. That's what the Bible says. No, the Bible, when the Bible uses wine, it doesn't always talk about intoxicating drink. No, just water. I'm not a Roman Catholic, bro. I don't drink wine at all. Gave up alcohol a long time ago. But you can, I mean, you can mock your drunkenness, but listen, you just sober up and get right with God. Drunkards won't inherit his kingdom. I know it is. I'm telling them the truth. I'm not telling you nothing. Then I'm telling you something. That's a double negative. If I'm not telling you nothing. I'm telling you something. Well, then walk away if you don't care. Stop speaking up if you don't care. I'm not going away until I'm ready to. I go here too. It's a public campus. No, I don't have to go to class to go here. No. I don't take advice from you. Well, that's your advice, and I'm not taking it. Not making any sense. But you're a sinner. What's new? No, I'm not. No, I'm not a sinner. For what? 
Why should I be ashamed of myself? I'm living holy, that's why. I obey God's word. That's how I'm not a sinner. A sinner is someone who disobeys God's word. A sinner is someone who disobeys God's law. I obey God's law. Oh, lots of purposes. No. No, I, I might gain from it this. I can look back at it later on and see how good I did. What's that? No, I didn't say that. Actually, that's not true. Go, go, go read constitutional law. It's not what it says. I never said I was going to use it for gain. Number one and number two, you're in. Number two, you're in public. It's called freedom of press. Yeah, ignore me. Walk away. What you should do? By telling them to ignore me, you're not ignoring me. Yeah, I'm relevant. All these sins are very relevant at this campus. Follow Jesus Christ. Give up your sins. Don't end up in hell. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That's right. Well... I know you're a pot smoker now. Thanks for revealing your sin. Yes, pot smokers will go to hell. I don't care what Washington or Oregon or Colorado tell you. Pot smokers will go to hell. God doesn't judge according to earthly laws, according to his own law. Of course they are. I don't have, it's not a comprehensive list. It's a very short list. Hey, but I don't, I don't run into very many rapists that I know of, so just trying to be relevant to my crowd. But hey, if you're out here and you're a rapist, you're in trouble. The Pope, he's an antichrist. He's an, not the antichrist, an antichrist. Absolutely not. Because socialism is stealing money from the rich and giving it to the poor. Jesus never talked about that. No, that's the rich giving their money willfully. See the difference? No, actually, so don't actually. Wait a minute, have you ever heard of the USSR? Did they let people escape? No, they didn't let people escape. So, so they're willingly giving their money away? Your theory is not working, young man. What about people who try to escape North Korea or China? Yeah. Yeah, what a choice that is. You have a funny definition of choice, young man. GS definitely was not a socialist. But he also wasn't a Republican.
These are ours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow us a moment to introduce ourselves to you. We are Duskies. Duskies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a song about my ex-girlfriend. Yeah, mine too. Mine too. Is she here? Hey, hey, shut up. Hey, maestro, let me get a C flat. <laughs> 